Hi, I'm uh, Srini Muthu. I'm a developer, productivity, and experience engineer at LinkedIn. I'll be talking about how Bazel can be fast, correct, and seamless, not to be confused with tomorrow's talk by Engflow folks on how Bazel is fast, correct, and secure. I think maybe after this year, we just retire titles of the form Bazel insert and adjectives choose in. And I think we had one before by Engflow folks with this format as well. Okay, so what's on the agenda today? We're gonna talk about a very brief history of Go at LinkedIn, A, because it's mildly entertaining, and B, because it's necessary context for the core piece of this talk. We'll talk about challenges to Bazel adoption, so spoiler alert, we're uh, proposing we move our Go ecosystem to Bazel. Evidently, we did not read Professor McIntosh's paper from earlier this morning. And then I'll talk about how providing a seamless developer experience, and I'll talk about what I mean by seamless, was really crucial to uh, pitch this to developers. And there will not be a QA and a because I made these slides before realizing there's no such thing in a lightning talk. But come find me if you have questions. Okay, so let's start with a very brief history of Go at LinkedIn. About 10 years ago, there was demand for Go repos at LinkedIn. It was primarily SRE driven. And you may know this, LinkedIn is primarily a Java shop, and Gradle is the prevalent build system. So back then, uh, Go developers uh, that aspired to write Go code had to make do with what they had. This meant they couldn't use Go mod to specify Go dependencies. They had to use a custom format that was resolved via IV resolution behind the scenes by a Gradle plugin. It's exactly as horrible as it sounds. And it was very painful. Uh, but it endured for a very long time, surprisingly. Eventually, the pain was too much to bear, and we ended up uh, moving to a makefile-based system. We call this native Go. Right now, it's about 50% uh, the old model and 50% uh, native Go, as we call it. So finally, developers got to specify their dependencies in a Go mod file, and we had make targets for common operations like compilation, testing, tidying the module, what have you. Um, I think the original authors of Bazel are better equipped than me to give a talk on why make files won't scale. But simultaneously, we ended up with a different kind of problem. We ended up in dependency hell. There was a proliferation of Go repositories and seemingly repositories of all kinds. And it took an absurdly long time to propagate changes from a low-level library to deployables. Developer velocity really suffered. So we decided let's tackle both of these problems at the same time. And uh, we pitched that we ought to move the Go ecosystem at LinkedIn to uh, a Bazel macro repo model, ideally a few Go repos at LinkedIn that get the job done. So let's talk about the challenges we faced when we first pitched this. We first pitched this last October, so a month before last year's BaselCon. And at the time, we basically told developers, well, you'll have to run Gazelle update repos to populate the workspace file with Go repository rules and seemingly infinite um, such rules. And you'll have to do this every time you hope to make any changes and iterate on your development. That proposal was pretty much dead on arrival because after almost a decade of enduring custom build processes for Go, they were not keen on adopting what they saw as yet another custom system that forced them to run commands they didn't understand. Fortuitously, actually the speaker right after me today, Tyler from Uber, uh, gave a talk last year introducing the GoDeps Bezel mod extension. Uh, and that was a major uh, deal for us. That phrase doesn't exist. It was a big deal for us. And it moved the needle for us because we could now um, have dependency resolution via the build graph, via the module extension, so developers didn't have to run that extra command. And Go mod uh, or other native Go manifest files were the source of truth for Go dependencies. This was awesome. But we, weren't, we couldn't just use the approach out of the box, A, because we are not a monorepo, we're far from it. And so it wouldn't just work out of the box for us. So we ended up adding native Go workspace support to the module extension. Uh, somewhat earlier this year, and we figured we'll take a small ecosystem at LinkedIn, the, the Go ecosystem that is, and set it up as a native Go workspace so that they all operate at head with respect to each other, but we still publish them separately so that we don't want to affect the outside world. And 
uh, it worked with the module extension because we ended up adding the native Go workspace support. Now we're almost there. Needle has been moved further, but we're not quite there yet. The final hurdle that we really faced, and uh, multiple people actually touched on this topic, was uh, selling uh, Bazel Devs. Uh, Prasanna from Ergata spoke at this over a whole slide. And we realized that they were quite keen on running native Go commands in their shell, and they did not want to let go of that experience. So we set to solve that. So this is really the core piece of my talk. <laughs> You'll have to ignore the obnoxiously wide picture, but it's useful. Um, what I meant by seamless was enabling the native Go uh, development experience in Shell and IDE, and I'll talk a little bit about the strategy we chose. We created a rule called setup, and we told developers, hey, run Bazel run setup, and it'll do a couple of things for you. One, it bootstrapped the Go SDK, and since it had knowledge of where the SDK was, we just set all the appropriate Go environment variables and just parked that in a file in Bazel bin. And then we used this um, shell extension called Duren that you might be familiar with, which automatically loads and unloads environment variables depending on your working directory. Essentially, this had the effect of developers when they switched to a Bazel workspace. Duren ensured that it automatically loaded all the appropriate Go environment variables, and they got to use native uh, Go commands. And another nice part is that Gazelle supports shared module cache between uh, Bazel build and Go build. So we just ended up uh, setting it up so that we could benefit, both Bazel and native Go builds could benefit from a shared module cache. Uh, the other side of the coin for the setup rule is that it also created a VS Code settings JSON file that populated all the Go environment variables for the LSP implementation settings, for instance, and other spots where appropriate. And we just had IDE functionality work out of the box for us for our Bazel workspace. I do want to call out an important distinction between uh, the model proposed in rules go for Go Bazel workspaces and the path we have chosen. Uh, where is Jay from Engflow? He's here somewhere. Hey, Jay. So thank you for that slide that is directly lifted from your awesome talk in 2022, which I recommend you guys watch if you haven't. Jay goes in depth about how the build it after model works. So let's talk super quickly about this slide. VS Code Go is the IDE front end. It interacts with the language server protocol implementation, which is Go Please, which in turn interacts with the Go package loader uh, that has the capability of working out of the box with the native Go tool. So in our case, when we try to resolve an import via the IDE, it just works out of the box because we can simply land at the package that we're hoping to jump into, for instance. However, the rules Go model, which is the build at after model, um, is such that uh, I have to mention that the Go package loader is written in an extensible manner. And by that, I mean other build systems can actually work with it if you guys write an adapter, which is precisely what Go package's driver is, and it chips with rules Go. Uh, under the hood, it is converting native Go targets into Bazel targets with a Bazel query, and then it builds them with an aspect. So pretty nifty. Uh, the the biggest advantage of the build it after model is that you can do uh, build time code generation. Uh, the generated bindings, say, from your proto buffs do not need to exist at the time you're hoping to resolve an import into a package for the generated binding. We don't have that luxury. So we pre-generate our code, and we run Gazelle after that, after which the IDE, Go and Shell, Bazel, all have the same view of our ecosystem. Um, one, I mean, uh, the thing that I'm really hoping to convey with this talk is that um, small things like supporting the Go CLI experience in a Bazel workspace goes a uh, really long way in terms of selling Bazel and helping drive adoption. Thank you.